Welcome to the 50th New York Film Festival presented by Film at Lincoln Center. I'm Devika Girish. I am the assistant editor at Film Comment and one of the programmers of the festival's talk section along with Madeline Whittle. And I'm thrilled to welcome you all to this very exciting conversation. We have amazing guests that you can see on the screen and I'll introduce them in just a minute. But I just want to say some thank yous and make some remarks. Um, the New York Film Festival has always been about bringing the community together to celebrate cinema. And whether you're joining us in our virtual cinema or at one of our drive-in venues this year, on behalf of everyone at Film at Lincoln Center, thank you for being a part of this historic edition. Thank you to the FLC board, patrons, members, and dedicated moviegoers who make our work possible throughout the year. As a nonprofit, we rely on your support and becoming a member is a great way to join our community of film lovers, take advantage of discounts and special offers while helping us to continue sharing the best in cinema. If you're not a member, please consider becoming one today. We are also very grateful to our tireless staff and volunteers working behind the scenes to make the festival happen. It's really been a team effort this year, so I wanna tip my hat to all my colleagues. In addition to screenings, you can access the New York Film Festival from anywhere with our free virtual talk series. Uh, taking place throughout the festival, we have two more left. I'll give you some more details about that at the end of this discussion. Do subscribe to the Film at Lincoln Center podcast for Q&As with filmmakers, panel discussions, and much more. You can also subscribe to our newsletter to make sure you don't miss out on any exciting updates or festival announcements. And join the conversation on Twitter, Instagram, or Facebook with the hashtag NYFF. Last but not least, a special thank you to our many festival partners, including HBO, the presenting partner of all Film at Lincoln Center talks. Uh, and now coming to today's conversation, uh, this is the festival report. Um, the festival's almost come to an end. We have a couple more days in a kind of spills over another week because of the uh, virtual format this year, but press screenings have uh, basically winded down and we wanted to get a group of critics together to reflect on this very unique, very different festival, uh, which was you know, different even before the pandemic happened due to the new structure and leadership, but now just completely new and improved. Uh, and you know, to do that, I have a really, amazing all-star lineup of people who really don't even need introduction, but I'll just tell you who they are. Uh, I'll start with my colleague, Clinton Crude, who's the digital editor of Film Comment. Hey, Clint. Uh, we have Eric Hines, who's the curator of film at the Museum of the Moving Image. We have Ella Bittencourt, who's a critic and curator. She runs the site Liseria. Uh, and I think she's joining us from Brazil, is that right? I am. I can say and we'll, to the bank. <laughs> Hello. And that's something that's pretty exciting that, you know, um, you were able to attend the festival as press from another country. So we'll get to that. Uh, we have Monica Castillo, who is wears many hats, but uh, most recently is the arts and culture reporter at CPR News in Denver, right? Oh, congrats. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, that's Colorado Public Radio. Perfect. Awesome. And last but not least, uh, very pleased to be joined by the absolute legend, Molly Haskell, who's a critic, uh, writer, and author of books such as From uh, Reverence to Rape, The Treatment of Women in the Movies. Thank you so much, Molly, for making time for us today. Well, thank you, and I enjoy meeting you all. All right, so, you know, this is, even though I'm, you know, I have this, background and I'm sort of in the moderator's chair. We're all, you know, veterans of these discussions. So I just want everyone to jump in with their fierce and spirited opinions about this year's selection. Uh, but to start us off, I'm curious to know what your experiences have been off this year's festival. Did you only do virtual screenings? Did you manage to go to any drive-ins? Were there any films that played better or maybe in unexpected way, uh, ways in your home screens or on the drive-in screens? Uh, anyone have any stories to share? I'll start. <laughs> <laughs> I thought, uh, you know, the first film of the festival, the opening night film, Lover 
Mars Rock, uh, which is part of the Small Axe Anthology. We're showing three of those films in the festival this year, which is historic in itself. Um, and they're films that chronicle various experiences of the uh, West Indian community in London from the 60s to the 80s. And we have Lover's Rock, Mangrove, and Red, White, and Blue. And the latter two films are sort of more directly about uh, the community's experiences of racism and police brutality. Lover's Rock is really different. It's very short, I think about 70 or 80 minutes from what I remember. And it's a house party. It's just one night at a house party. And, you know, the first day of the festival, especially all of us who were working on the festival, it was just it was a really melancholy experience to you know end that day and those weeks of work and not be able to like go into the theater or you know to go to a party and i just you know put up the film on my projector and it was the perfect bomb you know i felt like i brought the party into my home and i think the film of course i wish i had seen it on a big screen because i think of the three films the three small acts films in the festival it strikes me as the most cinematic. Like the other two are a little more televisual in format. And this one, uh, the kind of dynamic filming of it, you know, the way it plays with sound, with music. Um, you know, it goes from a cappella to chanting to, you know, different kind of volumes of music. I really wish I'd been able to experience that in the space of a theater. But there was also something quite special about experiencing a house party within the four walls off your home, you know, there was something, uh, I feel, felt like I could approximate that experience um, in kind of a unique way. And also, even though that film is the most kind of playful of the lot, there is this sense that within this house, there is this amazing sense of solidarity and celebration, but there are dangers lurking outside, right? So at one point, you know, the cops might come in. At another point, there's a group of white uh, sort of men outside who seem to pose a threat to the heroine, the, the central character. And so I think that experience of domestic celebration was so central to the film that um, I, I really enjoyed experiencing that at home. And I'm wondering if anyone else had similar experiences. Well, I mean, <clears throat> um, uh, one point of clarification that not only am I, was I attending the festival as a critic, but also as a sort of venue participant, whatever, exhibitor for the first time in my life, because the Queen's Drive-In, uh, where a lot of the screenings, uh, drive-in screenings are taking place, is uh, an initiative of the Museum, uh, New York Hall of Science, and Rooftop Films, which is responsible for all of the, or, or a player in all of the, the drive-in venues. So I was having experience of being at a lot of the drive-in screen, though, from, from walking around, uh, you know, and making sure things were going okay, wearing a, wearing a you know, you know carrying a transistor radio, which is a really strange way of experiencing films. You want to say drive-ins are a different way of experiencing screenings. Walking around a drive-in with a transistor radio on foot is a very strange one. Um, but, but, I, but, but, it, but it made me think that what you're describing, difficult, like seeing um, uh, Love's Rock at the drive-in and, 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 and loving it and appreciating that experience and seeing people enjoy it from their cars, I, I think that there's something defining about this year and the sort of this social dissonance of all of this. Um, sort of making do, finding pleasure in these unconventional ways and appreciating cinema in this, in these sort of new, you know, frankly compromised ways. And they're not, and those compromised ways don't necessarily undo the experience, but it is actually, I think, embedded in the experiences we're having right now. Um, and so like my, my version of that was seeing American Utopia last Saturday at the drive-in. And here's a film that's basically a, a beautiful record of a stage show from last year being presented not in a movie theater, though it's a movie, but you know, in a drive-in or at, you know, on your computer screen, however you're gonna see it. So that felt like it had several layers of being removed from whatever the original work was. Um, and instead of that being kind of a you know, shrunken, diminished experience, it actually felt quite rich because of it, because it felt like the longing to be in a movie theater, also the longing to be in, you know, on a Broadway, in a Broadway theater and the longing to be together and having an experience together actually kind of made the experience even more poignant than maybe if I had just seen it as part of the festival screen. Mm. Well, I think it was probably served better in a way seeing it this way because it's short and I mean, it's a, it, it's, it's really, 
I couldn't quite imagine it in Alice Sally Hall with the, with that audience of donors. And I think there was, there was something, this sort of spontaneity and engaging and you, and you realize it's just a party, that's all it is. The other thing, um, the music, of course, the great 80s music, but also the voices, these um, West Indian English voices are so musical themselves. And that's one of the, one of the facets of the music. And one other thing I thought, yes, there are white, sort of menacing white here and there, but basically the tensions are mostly within it's one of these films about blacks that's not bracketed by white racism. The tension mm. is within and within the two friends, the two women friends and all that. So I love that part of it too. It's just, it was just a purely like pleasure. I mean, there, there, yes, there's that tension and that kind of like looming sense of something maybe gonna, is going to happen that's bad. And I, I do remember at one point like waiting for the other shoe to drop, but yeah, um, but yeah mm. overall it's just a joy, it was such a joyful movie that it was like, uh, you know, a rare, there was that sense of community really came through. And um, it was kind of moving to even to be sitting in my living room alone watching it. Um, yeah, sad, mm -hmm. lonely, pathetic. No. But I, felt like, but I felt like there were other people in the world. Yeah, I. Go ahead. Mom. Kind of, no, I, I just love this movie so much. I actually, like, I finished it and I went back to rewatch some of the scenes that I loved. So in that sense, like having it on demand and having it ready at my fingertips was actually kind of a benefit, um, even though I would at some point love to see this on a big screen because I would love to, oh my goodness, like just be surrounded by that sound and by that environment. And, you know, a lot of the things that we can't have right now, just a basic dance party, a house party, you know, now it's like just so vividly captured in this one beautiful story. It was mm -hmm. just so nice to lose yourself in, in that space. And, you know, just going back to what Molly said about that, it not being a movie that's bracketed by white racism, I think that's a really good point and why, personally, I liked starting with that movie and then going to Mangrove and Red, White and Blue, because it immediately sets the tone for the anthology as we experience it as one about community, um, you know, as one about at the heart of it, like celebration, even if that celebration has to, you know, occasionally fight for its existence. Um, so I thought like that was definitely uh, just a good decision on part of our programming team as well to, to position the films that way. And I'm wondering uh, what your experiences or uh, how you felt about the other two films. I think I really enjoyed Mangrove as well, uh, maybe less formally because I did think that there were sort of structurally it did feel like a bit of a TV narrative to me the way it cuts between you know multiple little stories um, and the kind of uh, again like the ensemble cast that I think sometimes other than the main character Frank Critchlow and just to so that people know what the film is about uh, if they've not seen it already um, it's about this mangrove restaurant owned by this guy named Frank Critchlow that became become became a central point for um, the West Indian community in the Notting Hill area of London and where people sort of got together uh, to organize themselves socially and politically. And then that restaurant became a target of, uh, you know, police brutality and uh, they engaged in a protest that then led to nine uh, of the protesters um, being charged for, I, what is the exact charge? I'm, uh, I'm forgetting, but it's like and riot rioting. And like, uh, I don't remember the other one. Right. And then it turns into a courtroom drama, um, which, I mean, first of all, I didn't know anything about this history. I don't know if uh, other folks here did. And so that itself was very illuminating to learn about this, um, especially about like protest and police brutality, which is you know, been on everyone's minds. And of course, these films were made before the summer. But to get a sense of the globality of this phenomenon, and also like how far it extends into our past. So I really appreciated it from that point of view. And I also thought it was filmed in a very interesting way. And there's that one moment where one of the defendants, you know, a couple of them decide to defend themselves. And there's a central argument that's about how much you can see out of a police van, right? And he makes this cut out on a piece of paper. Spoiler. What? Spoiler. That's okay. That's okay. <laughs> At the end of the festival, I think. 
<laughs> it's <Yeah>. fine. <laughs> and I, again, I think there's a lot more to see in this film than just what happens. But you know, there is this point. I thought it was a very interesting, like, epistemic argument, right? Uh, where they had to, they have to resort to this the language of rationality to defend themselves uh, instead of the language of humanity, I would say. And so there, this whole argument about how many police officers can fit into the little uh, you know, gap through which they can see people on the, in the police van, and that becomes a central argument. And I think that McQueen does some interesting things in the way that he shoots the characters in certain scenes in like kind of constricting your view uh, in some way, like in red, white, and blue, there's a moment where a man gets beat up that kind of sets off events in that film. And it's all you can see is through the gap underneath the truck. And there's other moments where he's like really playing with distance um, that I thought like cinematographically, he was doing something very interesting that almost, I don't know, that sat I wouldn't say awkwardly, but like differently from the way the narrative structure seemed to unfold. I don't know if anyone had that same experience. Mm -hmm. Well, um, <laughs> well any, oh. go ahead, Monica. Um, I don't think I felt the same way in that sense, I, I only got around to red, white, and blue, unfortunately. Um, I missed my window to be able to see Mangrove. Um, Talking but, about windows. <laughs> yes, yeah, so the screening windows, is, it was only available for a certain amount of time and you had to see it within that amount of time because otherwise you would miss it. So unfortunately I, I miss Mangrove, um, but I'm looking forward to seeing the piece as a whole with all the, all the sections all together. Um, in addition to Lover's Rock, obviously we'll be watching that again. Um, but I thought that John Boyega's performance was just so incredible. I think he's kind of been discounted because, you know, he was given such a, you know, you know, small part and, and ended up being in the Star Wars movies. And then now here we actually get to see him like really dig into a complicated character, a character who's, you know, dealing with family strife, external strife, all these different issues. And he just does so, so well. I, I already can't wait to watch him in his next movie. Mm. And Clint, I remember you uh, wanted to talk about Mangrove as well. You said you really liked that one. Um, yeah, well, I don't know if I really liked it. I really liked Lover's Rock and uh, Mangrove, I think I do. I did like, but I I almost found it to be like uh, also kind of a bomb because it was this like very traditional, almost TV, like, uh, you know, law and order, like courtroom drama and there's a very clear villain and the villain is just this like vile person who's um, who's drawn really broadly i mean which you know fine and but what's interesting about the movie ultimately i think is that like it doesn't really like molly said it's i don't think as much as you expect it to be as much as you expect it to be it's not really defined by that villain or by that or by those racist characters ultimately the the central characters are rich enough and complex enough and kind of rise above that. And that, that's kind of what the movie's about as well. But uh, yeah, I th it wasn't, it was like an interesting and very, again, a very positive movie that could have felt very, that could have just been a very angry movie. And, um, or that I almost expected to be an angry movie. Mm. Like it was making me angry and I thought it would end with this kind of rage, you know, and kind of a, a bitterness. But it really, it didn't, it felt very positive and like it was opening a door to something. Um, and I think that there was, yeah, to me there, that was a interesting thing. I didn't see red, white, and, and blue, um, but I, I almost now kind of expected to also have that kind of positive, like sort of uplifting, or not uplifting, but at least positive um, vibration to it. Um, and uh, I thought that was kind of in contrast to some other movies to, uh, I don't know, I was thinking about how I also wanted to talk about, I think I said the 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 woman who ran the Hong Sang Soo movie and Isabella, mm -hmm. the uh, Matias Pinheiro movie. And I feel like both of those movies, both of those filmmakers, uh, especially Hong, I felt like his last couple of films were very light and and comedic and maybe not as dark as they had been in the past. 
And I feel like the woman who ran, in contrast to Mangrove and Lover's Rock, which deal with very intense situations, was much darker than I expected it to be, the Hong Note movie. I don't know if I'm alone mm. in that. And I feel like uh, the Pinheiro as well, a filmmaker who's often associated with games and playfulness. Uh, and his, but his films are, you know, serious as well. But I feel like was, Isabella was very was a little bit darker and kind of turned towards um, themes that we haven't really seen in his films before. Um, I don't know. That might. I don't want to turn to turn away from uh, small acts too quickly. But uh, that was just kind of a contrast that uh, was unexpected. I'd love for you to talk about uh, the woman who ran a little more. I loved it too, but I, I didn't see it as so dark. It's just a kind of. Um, I mean, I'm a, a big fan of his, the, the fluidity of these relationships and they, how they each one illuminates something different. Um, and, and mostly it's very, you know, very much with the sensibilities of the different women and the men are all sort of, and this happens a lot in his movies, but maybe more than usual, the men are sort of embarrassing or shabby or, um, and of course that, that ending. Yeah, they don't um, really appear, right? Sorry. Huh? There aren't very many. I don't think there are very many. They are. Well, there's a man who wants it, about the cat. Right. And, right. Yeah. <laughs> but they're sort of out there somewhere. I mean, the, the idea that she has to be, she's stuck. She and her husband are stuck together and he wants it that way and she wants it that way. And then she has to wonder, is this really the way we want it? We have to wonder about that too, that they, and the, the, I mean, it's a different, different forms of re, different kinds of relationships. Um, and at the end, we find out why she's the woman who ran away. Like what another spoiler, which I won't give away, but that's the kind of marvelous scene there where right. it, it ends in a very ambiguous way. Then you think, yeah. Yeah. yeah, of course. Yeah. But yeah, I and I actually, I mean, I think that the movie did remind me a little bit of um, On the Beach at Night mm -hmm. Alone. And so it had that same sense of melancholy. And of course the character, I mean, Kim min is in both films and different kinds of, I think she, in that film also, she's a woman who's running away uh, yeah. from, you know, something and a relationship that uh, has ended in a way that maybe has dim diminished her sense of self. And so in my mind, they were kind of companion pieces also because of the way the woman who ran ended. And uh, I won't give away too much uh, after Molly's kind of tease, but you know, there is like an oceanic element, if I can say that. Probably okay and... spoiling the woman who ran if we already spoiled Mang like Mang right. <laughs> I feel like, I no, feel like the spoiler crowd is not gonna really, is not gonna really get on this yeah. You don't know the Hong, uh, the Hong, the Hong spoiler like, crowd. <laughs> Hong social media fans will Warriors, the Hong yeah. the descend. Um, yeah. I think that the I think what I perceived to be kind of dark about it was that uh, the, that like looming these these the, the men in their lives that were these kind of mm -hmm. dudes and guys that were kind of um, in some way like pulling maybe just in the background or yeah. like, like drawing lines around what around and pushing these women in, into the lives that they were leading. Mm -hmm. They're hovering there. It's true, like the mountains. You know, they're just this right. immovable objects. It's true. That's very, a very good point. I think. And there are three movies that I just like are connected in some way in my brain. The Woman Who Ran, um, Simone Barb. If some of you ended up seeing that, and uh, it was. I mean. Yeah, it's just we should we should get into that as well. And then the third one is the calming, which I think all have itinerant women and all are in some way in a movie theater. And there was just something like they're all in a sense about isolation and also about cinema. Um, and they Can you just tell kind us of what the, uh, Simone Barbe is about. I, I missed that one, but I, I think it would be helpful to. Molly, did you want to do the honors for that one? Well, we first we it, it's um, it was made in what was it nineteen uh, nineteen eighty, and we meet these two girls and uh, they're ushers in a porn a porn movie house in 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 Mont Montparnasse, and it's just hilarious because you the, the two girls they're bored to death they do this every night and you're always hearing orgasmic sounds behind them they're three different theaters and these sort of pathetic guys <laughs> come and go, but they're all very different and it's very playful and very much a sort of um, inside cinema, sort of mise-en-scene. And at one point, 
Michelle Dillahai, who's a, a critic, was a critic for Cahiers du Cinema, comes in with his and the, and the interactions. I, I think it's very much. It, it's also in three different segments. So that's the first segment. And this incredible Ingrid Bourgoin, who plays Simone, is just fantastic. I think the film really is her in a way. You can't imagine it with another actress. And she then goes to a lesbian bar, which is just a hoot. It's just a wild life with um, fantastic music and people come out. I mean, these people come in, they're not, what I love about it is she doesn't try to pinpoint who this woman is. And it's a kind of performance aspect with her and her friend. They sort of have this ritualistic byplay every night and they tease each other and they get angry at each other. Then she has a whole nother persona almost when she goes to the, to the lesbian bar and which has some wonderful performances in it, some wonderful song numbers. And then she has the third segment, which is sort of mysterious where she picks up, it sort of both picks up and is picked up by this man who turns out to be a croupier and they go on this sort of joyless ride and she becomes a whole other person there. Did you feel that, 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 that she's kind of um, trying on different, at one point, because normally this would be about sex, all these things would be about sex, but at one, and she's, she has this thing, you, you don't know, you can't quite trust her, but she talks about, uh, so she used to dream of soul, souls being together, but now she says, now the thing is that women have to take care of themselves. So, <laughs> so in a way, that's kind of what she's doing. Yeah, and I think it's just, the opening segment is just, you know, <laughs> she and her friend Martine just kind of yapping, you know, I mean, they're just like exchanging barbs and uh, complaining about their job. They're both ushers. And it's just like this image of utter banality. And it, th there's this constant soundtrack of moaning, you know, just like a porn. It's just, it's a porn theater. So there's just this, these loud sex sounds constantly in the background while they're just yeah, they're just arguing. There's like these two weird uh, male characters. One of them is a director who complains about the quality of the print and the focus. <laughs> and there's another who's like a critic and he is he com comments on some of the actresses in the porn films and, you know, has this very snooty opinion um, of the artistic quality of the films. And there's just this is a movie that like to me is pure play you know what what cinematic play can mean uh and then she goes into the lesbian club and there's like this amazonian performance two women in amazonian like costumes uh having a sword fight it's yeah it just quite unlike anything else i saw on the program and so strange that it was made in 1980 you know it just feels like very forward and not not it like it's explicit or anything, but just in terms of its ideas. Yeah, and that whole fractured narrative now fits right in. I mean, it must have seemed sort of odd at the time because there's no mm. sort of narrative continuity in a way, and no narrative arc. But now that whole the, the, the three-part thing, the trilogy, seems to be sort of right at home in the in current cinema. Right. And I just, I do want to plug that Marie-Claude Trilou, who's the director, did a free talk with Serge Bazan uh, last week that's going to be on our YouTube soon. So I really encourage everyone to listen in on that, where they kind of talk about that moment in post, post new wave French cinema that that movie came out of. Um, but Ella, uh, I mentioned The Calming, which I do kind of feel is some weird way a companion piece to Simone Barb and the woman who ran, and I know that's a film you liked, and maybe you'd like to tell us a little bit, you know, what you liked about it. Yeah, I, I did. I, I love the film. I saw it for the first time at Berlinale, and um, since I am watching things only online, remotely as press, I had a, a slimmer slate, which I appreciated. I felt like I wasn't feeling pressured. I mean, usually I'd be just piling up films that I haven't seen, but I've actually got to, oddly enough, I got to rewatch uh, The Calming and Days, Simon Young's Days. And these two films are a couplet somehow. Mm. They're a pair for me personally, I think, because when I rewatched The Calming, I experienced it less as a film about isolation um, or even her being in transit, although she clearly is. And at the beginning of the film, I mean, just to say what it is, um, you know, a young Chinese artist 
has an experimental film viewing in Japan. So she goes off, she wants to visit the Kawabata snow country and experience the snow. So this is the, you know, the part of the country in Japan immortalized by the ride of Kawabata. And so she goes off and has this experience, but then returns to Hong Kong, returns home, returns to China to visit her parents. And I guess I, I did feel like deep down, there is something about this film is that it, that is about generosity and radical care towards, in her case, towards her ailing parents and to this kind of being present, her being present as she was trying to be present by herself in nature and experiencing and really hearing snow. I mean, there's a moment that's distinctly about her standing outside and the kind of crackling of snow and her being present in that moment that when she returns home, she's in a way replicating this experience with her family and finding her own presence in that. And so um, what I loved about the film that for me, it just felt like it's about an artist and her kind of in-between time where, you know, I, I think when we were thrown into isolation, it also kind of underlines that normally outside of that, when we're not experiencing the anxiety of constantly losing all the jobs and, and losing all the work and going through that. We're in that other cycle of, you know, and you do it as, as an interviewer, you do it with filmmakers or directors, is always what's your next project? What mm. is as soon as one thing is done, the next thing begins. And here, no, here is about the kind of opening up of that space and being in it when something is made before me, but it's very delicate and it's not so much a quest as just this finding this openness. That was very beautiful for me. You know, also because it's not, it's not about her spiritually kind of going off to an ashram or it's not a quest in that sense. It's very rooted in her every day and her being present with her family. She's dealing with things. She just broke up with the boyfriend. She's moving. So she's going through all these motions. But at the same time, you know, she's dealing with with loss. She's dealing with mourning. But but every time you feel that that that, that she's creating these little openings, you know, that there's a sense of this kind of calm, as the title suggests, overcoming. And I was just intensely moved by that. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I, you know, there's one scene in that film where she just like, she falls asleep on a train and the train like comes to a stop and then it starts again. And, you know, the camera just holds on her sleeping against the window, snow in the background. And that scene filled me with so much pleasure and just made me think of like this utter bliss of falling asleep on a train, you know, and you wake up and you've done nothing. You've been in complete rest and you're somewhere else like there's just something so magical about that kind of mm -hmm. stasis in motion that you know and i think the film is very much like an ackerman tribute like uh, you know it's sort of like meetings of anna i would think it's mm -hmm. a really a sister film to that and the director song fang i think developed it when she was traveling with her film to various film festivals so I think definitely the idea of the artist in between that you said sure. feels very on point. And it also reminded me of the Ackerman short film Sloth, uh, mm. or Portrait of, of Laziness. And of course, the song, uh, in the Song Fang film, it's not laziness, it's more of that, like you said, that time of openness. But there is something about like the creative work that takes place in the background. That's and when nothing is happening, I mean, like the nothing, the fact that the nothing is actually meaningful or that it has its particular texture. Maybe that's also for me, the connection to days in a way. I mean, it's not, it's a very different nothing in days, but the rigor of, of the insistence of the title days. I mean, it feels like these two men who will then, I mean, one of them is ailing, the other one is preparing his meal and you have this convergence of how these days or a day will then converge when they meet. Um, but the insistence of, of the fabric of that, not trying to somehow impose a story on it, not to deliver a life story of these two men, but rather staying very much in the present of you know staying in this kind of habitual cooking of your greens by you know having to go to the bathroom to wash them with the hose because you're in this intermediary space where your kitchen is your wardrobe is your other thing I mean staying in that nothing where 
sometimes even the human figure exits, you know, and um, that's very, that's very beautiful. And I, I think maybe that is a bit of a connection in with the coming in. Absolutely. And I think these like visceral portrayals of the everyday are very affecting right now. And Days is like, to me, I, I mean, I think that's the film of the festival for me, you know, I mean, there's just um, a lot has been said about it. So I don't know, like, I don't even know like what to add, you know, it's Simon Liang at, I think, his finest um, and mm -hmm. most precise and just the portrayal also of pain, you know, like, because uh, Li Kang Sheng is, has been ill and the film has kind of arisen from size filming off just like Li Kang Sheng uh, undergoing various treatments for a particular ailment and him just going about his everyday life and then going through various like massages. And I mean, that massage scene, which that's like kind of otherworldly, but these, um, I don't know, the just like embodiment in the everyday combined with like aging and aching. It's, that's the film that has made me feel the most. Though I will say, I also saw it in Berlin and it's probably like, it is one of the last films I saw on the big screen and it was really special to experience that stillness and that focus on duration and everydayness and the body and isolation and isolation in crowded spaces on the street in, you know, community with someone in, in that space. Um, I wanted to go from days to maybe the nighttime and ask Eric about a film that I believe he liked, uh, Notorno by Gianfranco Rossi. And, Eric, I know that you were also very pleased that uh, the new structure of the festival incorporated nonfiction work more seamlessly within the main slate. And I'd love to hear, you know, your take on that in general and maybe also Rosie's film. Sure, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, um, I, I was always an admirer of the way that the, New York, the roots of the New York Film Festival was in that there was this one encompassing slate um, that could permit both nonfiction and fiction, hybrid, experimental, et cetera. And I think it's a sign of growth of the festival over the years that it sort of started taking on sidebars and other sections, which I think is beneficial in so many ways. But in terms of fiction, nonfiction, um, yeah, it was always just, just because of my own interests and my own sort of passion for the art of nonfiction. Um, didn't like that there were some documentaries that were main slate and some were not. It's just, I never, never quite understood it. Um, and so kind of, Re, in a sense, re, reintegrating some major works of, of nonfiction into the main slate was was great to see. Um, and I think there were six features this year that are that might be called documentary. Um, and uh, you know, because I'm obsessed with these things, I think the highest percentage or the highest uh, number of documentaries that were in the main slate before is 1981, where there were 11. Um, and when you look at that slate, um, the sort of the diversity of nonfiction even within that slate is really thrilling to see. And I think it says a lot about the art of film when that can be the case. Um, so, you know, to you know, not at all surprised actually in terms of that being the case this year with, um, you know, folks like yourself and obviously Dennis Slim and, you know, other members of the programming community, Rachel Rosen and, uh, you know, Rachel Rakes and people who've done really great programming and nonfiction over the years. I don't mean to slight or forget other people on the programming team, but, um, but uh, yeah, so, so I, I, to me, I think it says a lot about the strength of the program. I think it says a lot about the strength of nonfiction filmmaking right now too. And I think that there's been a, a there's been a good run for years now of, of strong nonfiction works that deserve this sort of attention. So to see focus on, on, on these within the slate is amazing. A film like Gary Bradley's Time, which mm. um, to, to sort of, you know, for a younger filmmaker like that, you know, not too many features under her belt, for her to be in the main slate of New York Film Festival, to me, it's, it's an, in, some, in a sense, it's a no-brainer, but it's not necessarily the way that things, you know, had gone. So um, that's wonderful to see, and particularly an American documentary filmmaker too. You know, um, there have been a lot of great American documentary filmmakers that have never been in New York Film Festival. So it's great to see Garrett in there. But to your question in terms of Naturno, Jean Vega Rossi is, um, I, I, I think, one of, like a, one, of, one of the great artists of our time. And I think Naturno is one of, um, I actually don't, um, I don't know that I'm going to see a better aesthetic presentation in a movie this year than Naturno. Mm -hmm. um, the fact that that is made by a documentary filmmaker who's filming mostly alone 
um, is almost secondary. Like that's an amazing feat, like to think about exactly how he's getting these images, how he's getting these sounds, how he's constructing the films um, is wonderful to try to dwell on, but it's sort of secondary to the actual experience of sitting in front of a work like that, where you could actually not only get images that way, you know, images that striking um, and distinctive, um, but then also to, um, be, in order to get imagery like that, um, with a cast of characters, a cast of subjects, um, you kind of, you can't cut corners. You have to actually, you know, get gain a certain amount of trust. You have to gain a certain amount of, 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 of complicity and invisibility or whatever that, whatever language you want to use. Um, these are not happened upon images. These are composed images in actual settings where, where, where action is happening. Um, sort of blown away by it. I don't think that it's going to be for everybody. And I don't think that everybody is going to, I think some might be frustrated by it because it's very elliptical. Um, there's a lot left uh, for you to research and to look into and to maybe yeah. surmise about. There's a lot uh, you know, outside the frame that you might wonder about. And I think that's intentional. I think that that's sort of on to, up to us to kind of glean a little bit of what the, con the larger context is here. It's a film about, you know, you know, the regions of the Middle, of, Middle East that, um, you know, borders have been drawn and imposed upon, uh, you know, uh, cultures and, and in a place for over a hundred years. And basically we're living in the fallout of that. And he's just kind of like roving and, you know, from one side of a border to the other and, and, and documenting um, some of the behavior there. Um, and I think the sort of that borderlessness um, that he's, he's, he's looking for that. He's trying to find that. So I don't think the fact that um, we may not know exactly where we are in any given moment, um, which can be frustrating for a viewer, I think is really, really part of the, 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 a significant point that he's making. Um, so it's, yeah, uh, I, I think it's, um, it, it is, I gotta say, it's one of the films that I'm really, really upset that I haven't seen in a the theater um, with an audience, um, with a Q&A with Jim Franco. Um, I, I, I'd like that to happen at some point in 2021 because there's a lot to be gained from that. I think another master sort of uh, New York Film Festival regular that we have in the slate this year, but with the documentary is Gia Janka with uh, Swimming Out Till the Sea Turns Blue. Uh, I'm wondering if anyone has thoughts on that. I, I saw it in Berlin and I, I was very struck and surprised by it. Uh, I think people who've you know, the la I think the last film of his that we had in the slate was um, Ashes, Purest White. Uh, and, you know, I think before that, was it A Touch of Sin or am I skipping one? But, you know, you've had these kind of ambitious, sprawling, genre-inflected films. And then there's this film that's just, it's this beautiful uh, film of attention and storytelling that's about the changes that took place in China among you know, during the Cultural Revolution, but told through the anecdotes and testimonies of a series of writers, like very personal testimonies that kind of stitched together into a beautiful portrait. Um, I'm wondering if anyone saw that and had feelings about it. I agree with you. I'm, I'm, my favorite thing in it is one of the writers, he's, he's initially a dentist. He's working at a dentist and he hates it. And he has these people, this is during the period of now, I don't know what, but it's repression. And these people are going back and forth. They belong to the culture authority. And he says, that's what I want to do. I want to be, because they just walk back and forth all day. So then he decides to write and he writes a short story and he starts writing short stories and he sends them everywhere, everywhere, not discouraged. They keep coming back. And all of a sudden this editor discovers him and pays for him to come <laughs> to, where is it to share? Where does he go to, to the, um, I mean, I think, Be is it Beijing? Beijing. Or? I think Beijing, Beijing too. Yeah. And he, I mean, he becomes famous, but he's, he's just so funny. I mean, this is the, this, this, this is the sort of, the way he kind of fell into it, but clearly not quite because, you know, he, he was inspired, but I just thought that was a great part of the film. Yeah, and he goes, instead of talking about the craft of writing and the revelations of literature, he just talks about getting a per diem right. and, <laughs> You know, exploring the city for the first oh, time. Oh, the best thing. Then they say they can't publish it because it's too dark. It, 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 it has to have a happy ending. He, okay, I'll write a happy ending, you know. <laughs> you know, this completely, un, a completely unromantic approach to writing that actually feels romantic to me, you know, today. Yeah. <laughs> um, 
I think a film that a few of us wanted to talk about, and I'm especially interested to hear uh, what Molly has to say about beginning. Uh, we chatted about that before this this call today, Molly, and I think you were, and Clint also saw it pretty recently, and everyone who's seen it has just been shaken by that ending and just the kind of, I don't know, it's such a such an unsettling film, and I'm curious what you, what's your take? Well, it's, you know, uh, this woman, Dea, whose last name is unpronounceable, it begins with these Je Jehovah's Witnesses, and it's, it's they're, you know, they're practically like 30 shots in the film, and that's all. She has a fixed camera. It stays on. It's the beautiful early scene where they all gather in this church, and you see each person, each person, each person come in. So you get the sense of this sort of grassroots community that goes to this place of worship. And then there's the conflict, a uh, real fire, and they then have to make up their mind what to do next. It's really about the woman, the wife, and trying to figure out who she is and where she is. It's the kind of thing that happens, I think, in films now of women, especially if they're in very conventional, traditional communities and they suddenly feel an urge to get out of this. You know, one of the things that sort of reminded me of the community that the Jehovah's Witnesses, it's like Amy Coney Barrett, you know, the uh, people of praise, and they have to be together. I mean, it, there's a story today about her father got an offer for a big job in, they lived in Louisiana, got an offer for a job in Texas, a lawyer. He went there and he decided he couldn't stand it because he had to come home and be with his flock. And that's the whole idea here. The husband is the pastor. He has to be with his flock. She wants to try other things, but he can. And so she's caught here. And then this series of things happen. And again, it's one of these, to me, people would say that it reminded them of Redegas or uh, Paul Schrader, but I kept thinking of Ackerman, of John Dealman in this because you have mm. these long scenes and she walks in and out of the frame, and but it's much more mysterious because these things happen, or do they? This guy comes purportedly because he's following up on the fire, but he's a, the policemen are sort of against them. They're with the Christians who started the fire, and then he comes on to her in this really re repulsive way, or at least aggressive and graphic way, and she sort of responds, she resists and responds at the same time. And it goes on from there. And then that I really don't want to talk too much about what happens because it's so shocking and, and you just have to see it. And I, I, I found the ending, I mean, what she, happen, what she does vis-a-vis -vis this so-called policeman and with her husband. But um, I thought, you know, I don't use the word ineffable very often, but it really is one of those, it's, it's, it's she says somewhere in the middle, I, I, I keep feeling something is going to happen. It's a beginning or an ending. So she's caught in this sort of no man's land and, and looking for a guidance. And then, and then she is always at home in nature. That's one of the things that her, this one encounter with her mother, when she was a baby, she took her outside in the snow and she was always at home in nature. And you have these gorgeous shots. This is in Georgia of, of, the, of the, you know, lakes and countryside. And that's the only time you really feel a kind of exhilaration the rest of the time you feel this confinement, even though it's a beautiful, she lives in this beautiful house, there's something kind of sterile and this sense of dread like you have in Chantal Ackerman. And then the end, I, I'd love to hear what you have to say about it. I mean, I just felt it was kind of dust to dust. It was this organic, non-human thing that happened and it was just staggering, I thought. I mean, the ending, it seems, is a total question mark to me, but um, the movie it is, is yeah. But it's also uh, important to point out that like the most horrifying scene takes place in an, in nature in this beautiful natural setting with this, you know, it, and you're kind of hypnotized by the shot, and then that you don't really know what's going to happen, and then I mean it's really just sort of uh, difficult to watch. But uh, it, but it's also, I mean, yeah, it's an incredibly beautiful movie. But I think it's also very much like a, you know a religious, a very religious movie. Absolutely. Yeah. Or possibly, you know, anti-religious, but it's a movie about oh, faith yeah. and about testing faith. And it opens with a sermon about Abraham and Isaac. And then it mm. proceeds to test this woman's, this woman goes through something, you know, not too dissimilar from what Abraham, or mm. I, think, I think she perceives herself to be in that role. Um, I just think that it's, but, I mean, to you know, 
it all works because it's so beautiful and because mm. the the depth of the shots they just go on forever some of those shots of fields you can just sort of there's layers and layers to to sort of look into and different things happening and it all kind of like yeah I'm, it's a very mysterious and very beautiful. Well, I think you do sometimes feel a certain impatience with it. I have to say that because it is long and it is static in that sense. And there well, is impatience and yet, yet somehow at the end, it, it's completely redeemed, it seems to me. All that time spent is somehow justified. I'm not sure why. I mean, it, it, it's just mysterious. I mean, the other thing that, is, that uh, struck me is that no one else sees this other police officer. Yeah. It's the imaginary. I know. And he appears, I mean, I, you know, and that by me, like, you know, not to be too literal, but, you know, I just read him as the sort of, uh, you know, uh, I think they talk, he talks about Satan mm. um, uh, manifesting as the angel of light. And he comes out of the fire and kind of tw tweaks the kid's nose mm. and then walks into the fire again in that mm. opening scene. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, it, it is, it, it's, there's, it is trying to watch, I guess. But yeah, it is, it is somehow um, redeemed, for sure. Well, I think the opening sequence, there's this rupture that happens that keeps you riveted throughout because there's repeatedly these moments of rupture among like the stillness. And they're so sudden that it's hard to look away. I mean, it really suspends you in that sense of anticipation and precarity. And really was a film that, I think on a bodily level made me so deeply uncomfortable that I think that's how I think it was ineffable for me. You know, I just couldn't even articulate a reaction, but I admired this sense of control, the sense of framing to be really able to convey, yeah, that those horrors in such a, an embodied way. And then, but he, yeah, the ending scene just kind of suddenly lifts it into the realm of myth. You know, and so you go through this extremely harrowing experience that feels that you, you it feels very visceral. And then there's just something else that happens. I mean, you just, you question everything and, and the narrative of faith maybe takes on a different meaning, like spirituality takes on like a different meaning. And I don't know, I think it's her debut feature. You know, I just, mm -hmm. I was just absolutely blown away. She did a talk with us recently and she's just so cheerful and sweet. <laughs> <laughs> and I just, after watching this film, I just expected, you know, a very different personality. She's very young. She's just absolutely lovely. And yeah, I, did anyone else, Eric, Ella, or Monica, did you guys see the film? Yeah, I've seen it. Did you like it? Or? No, I, I, I mean, I, I, as you described, I, mean, I, I definitely love that there are so many things that are to be, that are unresolved. I mean, if anything, it seems that there's a certain biblical logic, and I haven't thought of that before, but that Clinton mm. mentioned, that if it's carried to its extreme, to its most logical, it's extremely brutalizing. And if you buy into it, then something like the sacrifice of Isaac is the absolute brutalization um, that maybe plays out. I love the architecture of this house. You know, it made me at times think of Altman's images, maybe because I saw it recently, but just this tiny suggestiveness of this mysterious light. She keeps on, the camera keeps on pointing to open doors, and it's strange. It's like we're, we went down some kind of a hallway of the mind that, that we don't know where it leads to. I mean, I, I, I love that kind of suggestions of the labyrinth. And the, and the things that we won't know. I mean, this character, she, yeah, she goes outside. She goes outdoors into the nature. That's one of those, um, you know, patterns straight out of a genre film that you don't necessarily know how to justify psychologically within the logic of this particular movie. And yet she goes outside. And, you know, I think the film opens with her saying, I'm very concerned about me. She says this early on, and it doesn't seem like a very religious feeling. It just seems like there's something in the fabric between her and her husband and the power and this idea of the female desire is dangerous that worries her, that is on her mind. And, and then it proceeds to unravel. Um, that reminded me of a different, I mean, it's interesting. There was a different Georgian film, not the Hollywood version, but the, um, 
Scary Mother. There was a film by Anna Rushadze, I think it was, that, that played, I don't recall if it was in Locarno in 2017. That was also about that in some ways. That was about this female desire as, um, as concerning to those around her, in like very kind of power hierarchical way, this attempt to contain it and then her mind acting out against that, yeah. A strong, strong debut. Um, we're near the end of the hour, so I, but I do want to get a few more films from everyone. And also, some people have submitted questions. We'll try to take a few questions at the end of the chat. So now's your opportunity to use the Q&A button at the bottom if you'd like to ask us anything. But, um, you know, there are also this year, shorts have been integrated in a different way. And, you know, they're part of the Currents program. There's a really wonderful um, selection of short films. But actually, before I get to the short films, I wanted to ask Monica if uh, she'll talk about a film that I know she liked, The Human Voice, which is a 30-minute film by Pedro Almodovar. So it is on the shorter side, and uh, it's in the spotlight section. And, and Monica, you mentioned that that's, that was a film that caught your interest. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's a Moldovar. Why wouldn't it catch anyone's interest here? Um, but of course, it's really Tilda Swinton's show. Uh, it basically follows her around this very beautiful, very a Moldovar-esque house um, as she's sort of trying to break up a relationship, but the person that she's in the relationship with doesn't actually show up. So it ends up just being really about her, really about the dog, really about her using the space, how she inflects her voice, how she has this argument with herself because we don't hear the other side of the conversation. It's really just about her. And yet the way that he films that the way that of course she performs it, all of these ingredients just create like this riveting little package of a beautiful short. I mean, it could have been a feature length. Uh, I would have continued watching. Uh, it was just so fun from beginning to end. And Ella, you had a couple shorts as well that you wanted to talk about, which are like short shorts. Um, yes, I, I have. So I think, I mean, I think the the shorts program is probably the one that was, that's very different for me when it's online. I felt like I jumped around a lot more and a short form, it's it's wonderful because it's so non-committal. And yet when it you commit, it can be so rewarding 20 minutes at a time, you know, you just kind of do 20 minutes between your writing or in your day, at least that's how it worked out to me. So it's very different than coming into a full session of shorts at a festival. Um, and I love seeing shorts because I, I think sometimes more daring stuff happens in the shorts program. Um, I saw this year a short by um, an artist from Taiwan, Su Che Yu, called Single Copy. That was absolutely stunning. It was a story of um, a Siamese twin who got separated from his brother. It was a very complicated surgical procedure in the late 70s, and he was only three years old. And so they had to be carved out, and um, they were sharing a, a leg, which then had to be sacrificed. So like there was a, a third leg. And then, um, so anyway, but what happens in this contract and this wonderful collaboration between this man who is now in his 40s and is really telling the story and the whole short is very haunted because the brother, I guess, died in the early 40s. Uh, so now he's the only sibling of this, of this couplet. Um, that they they kind of stayed he says that he has this recurring dream when he's a driver on an of an abandoned bus and so they restaged the they restaged this abandoned bus and so this kind of that he's in this dream landscape where he says he was also dreaming of his children so they put in like a digital um, cut out, I guess, of his children into it. And he walks through this landscape as he's telling the story of what it is that he kind of remembers of himself as a three-year-old three being, you know, in preparations for this very complicated surgery that was also on TV. Um, it, it's just gorgeously done. And then they go to um, 
digital scanning of his body and then modeling of his body and then becomes this wonderful magical story about kind of having the body and the body's other experiencing the body as as the other and mm -hmm. and also the body's memory i guess the artist is interested in the construction of memories and um this man has very kind of uncanny recollections of what it was to be a five-year-old that still somehow thinks somewhere that he is really physically still connected to his brother and what that's that experience in the body is and it was just visually really gorgeously rendered um and very exciting i mean it's just an exciting thing to see yeah so that's mm -hmm. one short i don't know if someone wants to jump in and um i i'm just kind of going around and you know everyone when we were kind of planning for this talk, everyone's viewing had been so different and everyone's favorites had been so different, just like a very eclectic uh, experience of the festival. And I want to make sure we we touch upon some more films. And actually, there's an audience question that would lead, I think, right into Eric. Uh, someone just said, uh, I hope there is time to talk about Gunda and the Truffle Hunters. Uh, both are brutally honest and they're at the top of my list. And I know that they were on your list as well. Yes, well, I mean, uh, Gunda in particular. I think Gunda's fantastic. I mean, Victor, mm. I mean, my, my, my only grumpy, I, I, I'm sorry to be a broken record, but I, my only grumpiness about Gunda is the response to that has been as if this miracle of, 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 a, of a film um, that sort of dialogueless, you know, portrait of, of a farm um, and of a family of pigs in particular came out of nowhere, but it's sort of the latest uh, work by Victor Kozakowski, who's an incredible artist, is making, you know, kind of, um, uh, boundary pushing documentaries for a long time since the late eighties um and uh yeah i'm uh, it's a it's a it's a feat and it's also just wildly entertaining uh that film um and so it's so great to see it here um uh and i'm glad that the person in the audience uh, loved it as well um and 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 I got another film that you know that played at the drive in and to see that on the big screen people respond to that film on the big screen again basically mm -hmm. a silent film black and white based on a family of pigs and for there to be, yeah. to be so to so eventful and so um you know it layered and interesting um and thrilling uh i'm, I'm i have to admit i'm i'm less of a fan of the truffle hunters um mm. which uh is a little bit more um uh it's it's a it's a little quainter than I want it to be, um, and I feel a little bit like I'm I'm too far on the outside of the culture that's being recorded in that film. Um, there's something about the older, um, and it's about just so people know. <laughs> yeah, it's it's about it's about this group of kind of older people in northern Italy who go hunting for the precious white alba truffle with their like sniffer dogs, right? Right. Right. Okay. <laughs> it's, just, it's, just, it's just a little precious for me. Um, mm. And it was a little bit like we're supposed to think that these people are adorable, which they are, um, but that's sort of not enough for me. Right. It does seem like one of those things that a filmmaker goes like, that would make a good document. You know, one of those like subculture films, which, um, so I, I, I get that, like the preciousness element of it. And actually, maybe kind of related, Clint, I know you want to talk about Nomadland, which, uh, is like, you know, has documentary elements in it and is also about a subculture of, of people. And I think I'm a little mixed on it. What did you think? I think you have me mistake, uh, you know, confused with somebody else. <laughs> we can talk about Nomadland. Um, Mistaken I, in what, like you didn't oh, like I, it as I much? Really, I, I am kind of lukewarm on Nomadland as mm. well. Me too. It, it seems like a real uh, missed opportunity is how as, I mean, it just, I feel like the, you know, I don't, yeah, that's, that's how I'll, that's how I'll phrase it. <laughs> I'll leave it at that. I, I feel like Nomadland begins and you expect it to be, it's very clear, it's very clear what it could be about. It could be about in, uh, two different things, sort of, it could be about the socio-political, you know, engine that is surrounding this woman, or it could be about this woman's experience of grief or it could be some sort of, you know, blended, ver uh, blended, you know, narrative of these two things. Mm. But it really, I feel like it can't decide. And ultimately, it just kind of drifts into like not really being about either of those things. So it's not really. And so I was, I was very, um, I was just left kind of cold by it at the end. 
but uh, I don't know if that just might have been my experience. I don't want to be too hard on Nomadland. I agree. I think it's fascinating. These people exist. I didn't even know about them. These people who have chosen not to have houses and they live all over the country and they're all different sorts of people and they meet up once in a while. And I thought all of that was really fascinating. You, they're living on the edge. They get contemporary jobs at Amazon or this place or that place. And there's a lot of humor and a lot of life in it. And then suddenly it just seeps out. It just goes on and on and on. And it's not, as, as you say, it's neither about one thing nor the other. And the grief, the whole theme of the grief sort of dissipates because I, I just think it's too, I think it just, it, it, she hasn't been tough enough on the, on the, on the shape and the length of it. I mean, it's yeah, oh, go ahead, Eric, sorry. I was just, or quickly, I was just gonna say like, I expected there to be some anger too. Like the grief yeah. would lead to some anger. Like mm. why was this town destroyed? Mm -hmm. what are the, there's reasons for it. There yeah. are people who made decisions to do that. Mm. But it never takes that leap. She just sort of, it's this mournfulness that just kind of, it's just, and that it ends at mournfulness. And I feel like it's just begging, the, that question is just begging to be asked um, by the movie. Go ahead. I, I, I would, I, I agree with that. Um, the only thing I would, I would add, and I, I think I'm in the minority here, but I actually like this film more than I like the writer, which was a really celebrated film. Um, one of the reasons being from the nonfiction angle, the thing that with the writer that bothered me is that it felt like there was fictional shape or story imposed on real people. Um, mm -hmm. And I, I found that tension to be very frustrating. Whereas some of what we're describing is I, I agree with that are, that are some issues with this film, I think almost come from going deeper into the area that I find more interesting, which is coming up with a narrative based on kind of documentary or reportorial um, exchanges, like getting to know these people, getting to know why, getting to know some of what, you know, um, whether it's chosen or imposed on them in terms of their economic situation or their, I say their, their sense of freedom, um, sort of like getting things from meeting them and then putting that into the film and having that depicted in the film, which I think is a strength. And I like seeing that it feels very, it feels actually quite connected, but I think finding a way of shaping that mm -hmm. properly and also giving some of the sociological under you know the underpinnings of that and actually making that part of the text i do feel like it it it, it, it doesn't quite get it and if i can kind of jump on eric's point i also was pretty favorable on nomad land but mostly because i think the decision not to have that anger the decision to not have you know all the different emotions i think a lot of people were really anticipating something a little bit more oscar grabby or so uh, from this movie, and then it ended up being very, you know, low, low key. Um, that's what I liked about it. But that decision is a choice. That is also an action. But the fact that she decided to go down that route was interesting to me. So that's why I, I ended up pretty enjoying it. I, I mean, I don't know. I, I want the lukewarm side of things. And actually, maybe what I thought was the problem was maybe there's like there was a fetishization of Frances McDormand's performance at the expense of other elements of narrative or context. You know, I like sort of, I think I'm with Clint in that the emphasis was so much on grief, which she is. I mean, she is kind of embodies and evokes that really powerfully. You know, you're very moved by her performance. Um, and maybe the film was so fixated on capturing that, that I think there were some contextual elements that fell away. And I, I, I mean, I think I loved the writer. Um, and I think that that and her, uh, the film before that songs, my brothers taught me, I think it's called, um, there is some, there is a way in which it was like really capturing a culture more than a person, maybe because they were, you know, people drawn from that community that somehow that didn't translate in Nomadland to me. And it could also be something I brought to the viewing as like, okay, this is a film that Frances McDormand did it, who is embedding herself in this community. That awareness maybe played into how I viewed the film, but I just, I couldn't get past that. And I couldn't get past the, that conceit, you know, it is, it is a gimmick. I mean, which I don't mean that in a pejorative sense, like a gimmick can be good or bad, but it is a gimmick to like, take a star or actress like that and put them in those circumstances and to kind of build a film around that, that, yeah, that sort of didn't work for me and felt a little false, but to each his own. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, Molly, uh, you had a couple films as well that you wanted to talk about. I think you mentioned The Salt of Tears, the Philip Garel film. Yeah. 
Um, well, that, that's not breaking any new ground, but I, I like it better than a lot of it, some of the recent ones. Um, it, it, in the very beginning, you had this shot of this young man and young woman at a bus stop. It's a sort of dreary, it looked like a working class section of Paris. And they're very, both of them are shy. They, they, they look at each other, they're attracted to each other. And finally they start talking and you just drawn in, at least I was, and especially to the guy, Luke. Um, and she says, you're not like other men. There's something so shy. It's sort of pudique, that French word, pudique, reserved and shy. And it's, uh, there's not a cell phone inside. There's something sort of, I think, consciously nouvelle vague about it. Mm. Um, because of that, it's a sort of pre hookup, you know, and, and they're shy. They don't have, they don't have, you don't see a cell phone for about 45 minutes. Well then, so she goes with him and it turns out that he's kind of a monster in a way. And with the utmost charm, it's like a portrait of a serial killer, emotionally speaking. He's so passive and he goes from one person to another. He's a uh, carpenter. He's there to get his carpentry degree and a, car a carpenter like his father, Andre Wilms is wonderful as the father who's mm. the sort of emotional center of the piece. But he, then he goes home and immediately his, uh, a girl he used to know in school comes on to him and he falls into the tub actually with her. And then, so he's torn between these two and he's sort of finally sort of, he doesn't really choose the second one. He just, there she is and the other one isn't. And he just, he really, really um, almost destroys both women. And you sort of, what was wonderful is how you're, you're seduced by him. I mean, I felt, did you see it? I felt he was so seductive and then you sort of gradually realize that he had, he, he's like a sociopath and that he can't, he can't empathize with anybody. He has no empathy. And the father has clearly sort of spoiled him in the, and Wilm sort of looks at him, you, you think, he's sort of thinking, what have I done when he sees what the boy's like? And he just goes through a succession of relationships and there's no great moment of epiphany, but there is the kind of payback at the end when his father dies. And that's the only person who, who loves him. And mm -hmm. it's a really, uh, it's a kind of devastating, but in this sort of quiet, quiet, um, deceptive way. Yeah, it's a, it's a very strange film. And I actually love your <laughs> description of the character as like a portrait of a serial killer. I think that actually stays a lot because there's this, I, I mean, the word I was going to use was fuckboy. Uh, mm -hmm. But I think a sociopath is like closer to that, like, in sense of emotional remove that can initially come off as some kind of awkward charm that you saw. Yeah, I was just like, that's a, yeah, notorious for, for their charm. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but then they, it's just like, it's arrested development, you know, as it goes on, it's just an inability to connect. I am curious, when I saw it in Berlin, one thing that like really took me out of the scene, uh, the movie was that scene when they're going dancing and there's this kind of encounter with like skinheads or I don't know, this, uh, like racism, racist encounter that, you know, one of his carpentry mates had. And it just, I didn't know how to contextualize it. Um, mm -hmm. It just took me out because I read it as maybe like a slightly cheap way of, of pointing to his um, solipsism or pointing to, you know, the fact that he lives in this insular world and there's this like political uh, context around him. But uh, what right. do you make of that? No, I, I don't. It comes out of nowhere. There's a beautiful black woman who's, he's got a black buddy and he's found this beautiful black nurse he's going out with and suddenly these skinhead types attack them and get into a brawl. It's this little bit of racism that just comes out of the blue and I don't think it, it sort of reveals anything particularly. I'm not sure either why it's in there. Yeah, and that just, I, I, I don't know if like, it also seemed a little uncharacteristic for Garel and I was just, um, yeah, I was just wondering if it was kind of an up, you know, updating the film to the times in a way that came off as awkward. I'm not sure. I'm not even, uh, yeah. Okay, and then, uh, you know, there is one of the audience questions is just what it was everyone's favorite films, which is just like a very difficult question. But maybe I thought I, I do want to give everyone the opportunity to shout out a film or gotta go talk Nomadland. about a film that we didn't get to. Got to be no huh? said got to go with Nomadland. <laughs> the number one yeah. consensus film. Uh, well, I but Clint, I did feel bad that oh, sorry, go ahead. I was just gonna say I, I wanted to talk a little bit about Hopper Wells. I don't know if anybody saw that. This is a documentary when Dennis Hopper came up from shooting the last movie in 1970 and Austin Wells interviews him. And 
it's like a slightly more genteel version of the presidential debate. I mean, Wells is a, a total bully. He, he goads and bullies and condescends to Hopper. He just so, <laughs> and attacks him. And Hopper never rises. He's probably you know, stoned, but he never rises to the bait. And it, it, it struck me as very revealing about Wells because he's usually he, more revealing than when he's the one being interviewed. When he's being interviewed, he's completely evasive. He manages not to ever answer questions. And here, he keeps on at Dennis Hopper. And Hopper, there's one um, interesting thing where he's talking about showing Easy Rider, and he showed it in the South, and everybody yelled, cheered when they shot the guys. He showed it in LA, or no, in, 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 I don't know, UCLA, and everybody said, get the pigs, get the pigs. So you have these absolutely mm. opposite reactions, which is a sort of prefiguring the chasm that we're, we're living in today. But Well seems to think that he, he sort of casts Dennis Hopper as a spokesman for, he thinks that they are the heroes and, and Hopper doesn't feel that way. He said they are outlaws. It's, it doesn't mean they should be killed, but they're, they're outlaws. Um, and he's ta he taking a kind of middle course and Wells keeps pushing him and pushing him to be a revolutionary. And it's just, I don't know, it's sort of, um, it's, a, it's sort of, first of all, hypocritical. I mean, he says, you ought to be a spokesman. You ought to speak out. Why? You know, I don't know if anybody else saw it, but I, I just thought it was fascinating, not because it's a great film or because it's anything exactly new, but it just shows something, to me, it shows something about Wells um, that, I don't know, he, I mean, Dennis Hopper's coming up from Peru where he's living with, where the hippies are armed in this armed commune and the feds are right nearby and, and Wells is trying to get him to form a, a common turn and <laughs> to start a revolution. <laughs> it's just insane. It is beautifully shot though. It that is. I, yeah, it's, it's just so gorgeous. Um, yeah. Even though it's so casual, I was really struck by that. And Wells I always in the shadow. Wells, you know, this great giant in the shadows. <laughs> Clint, I feel kind of bad because I uh, foisted a film uh, as your pick that you were lukewarm on, Nomadland. So I want to give you a chance to uh, bring up a film that you think represents you better. No, I'm just not going to do it. <laughs> you shouldn't have done that. No, I, I <laughs> first off, I, did, I, keep tr I kept trying to chime in with a joke about Joe Biden being compared to Dennis Hopper probably for the first time. <laughs> but um, yeah, it didn't land too well. And then uh, I guess, uh, what's, what was my favorite, or what's the movie? I guess I really liked uh, two movies that we haven't talked about um, from Currents, The Inheritance, and um, mm. I also really liked Slow Machine, which mm. um, I was much, was much more richer than I expected it to be going in. Um, um, but, which, the Slow Machine? Actually, I, I, that's one I haven't got, gotten to, and uh, I think it just started screening, so many people might have not seen it yet. And if you, could you tell us a little bit about what it's about? Uh, sure. It's, I mean, it's about uh, a, an uh, actress who, who's kind of adrift in this kind of like Pinchon world of paranoia and like artists, and she. Um, gets kicked out or she leaves a house that she's living in with these weird drug addicts and goes upstate to I think um, what and goes upstate to stay with some some friends and um, who are uh, musicians just sort of uh, Williamsburg hipsters of the mid 2000s recording uh, an indie rock album um, and this she the woman who plays the the lead is, or that the character just constantly changes her accent, which is one of which is really interesting. She has a Texan accent when she's upstate, but she's playing the same character who left New York, where she was Swedish. And at one point, she goes into this long monologue in the Texas accent when she's in New York. I mean, I can't really describe the plot because it's completely nonsense, and it just like it is, it, what it is is it's sort of a mood of paranoia and mm. of like things falling apart and in, the, in this woman's life but also kind of in society or in the world outside of, of this woman's kind of insular social world of artists um, and their ilk and uh, 
there's this great scene, Chloe Sevigny is in it, uh, she has a, um, she's in it briefly, but she has this great monologue where she talks about going to this kind of post-apocalyptic uh, audition for a, a play or a movie in a warehouse and, and the two people auditioning her are wearing like hoods and she can't see their face and she, and it's just this bizarre kind of um, terrifying, but all, yeah, scene. I don't know. It was just, I think that what, I, what most appealed to me about the movie was the fact that it was both kind of scary, but also kind of funny. Like it was open to moments of humor of these moments of these kind of scary moments turning into suddenly into mm. more comical scenes. I don't know if did anybody else see it. Feel it? No, I want to see it. Can you unexpire some of these films so we can look at them? <laughs> we'll <Expire>. talk offline. <laughs> But I have to say, uh, this has come up many times in like our talks and discussions. The current section, which is a new section of this year's festival, really is the comedy section this year. Like it has some of the funniest films. Uh, and that includes, I mean, The Inheritance is just this extremely rich, politically rich film that engages so intelligently with history and activism and is also just, you know, is full of gags. Um, and I also love the two Heinz Emigold's films, The Last City and The Lobby. Um, you know, I don't want to go into too much detail because we, we are running out of time and I want everyone to get their shot. But these are, you know, kind of extending his uh, film from a few years ago, Streetscapes, Dialogues, and this, these forays into psychoanalysis and uh, kind of meditating on the nature of cosmopolitan exist you know urban existence in very creative very discursive ways and it's just there's they're just absolutely hilarious and unpredictable like actually i think two of the films that i could not have guessed what they would be like and that surprised me minute to minute i won't say too much more because we actually have heinz tomorrow for a talk with christian petzel so i encourage people to come to that and hear more about the films uh but i just wanted to drop in those names and um mm -hmm. eric uh i want to kind of i want to pass on the mic to you to see if uh there's a film you want to give a final shout out to it's just it's just confusing when you talk about heinz but you're not talking about me um uh that's I, I true <laughs> i missed a great segue from heinz <laughs> to mr heinz <laughs> um I, I don't i don't know that i need to 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 use any more time but to say, to see time. Uh, I don't, I feel like that's the thing that, uh, that's, if I could use any space to talk about any movie in 2020, it's to say that. Mm -hmm. um, and it's so good to see that the festival, it's coming out this weekend, I think, um, in theaters and will be seen on Amazon soon enough. Um, and yeah, I just think, I think it's the film of the year. Um, and I encourage everyone to see it if they haven't seen it yet. Mm. Uh, Ella? Well, I'm, I'm geo-blocked for time so far, but I absolutely can't wait to see it. So every time I go to my laptop, I say, darn, I'm still geo-blocked for this. The one imperialism of, of But I really, I really, I know. I mean, it's just, it has that certain vibration of it. I think it's wonderful when there's a film at the festival that we all know vibrates with a special quality and it will eventually arrive and I'll see it on my projector and I'm super excited about it. I mean, I think, I don't know that I have a favorite to leave off on. I think I can only say that because I'm in Brazil, where you know a lot of archive-based institution in, institutions, including Brazilian Cinematheque, are in terrible crisis and in terrible danger. It's absolutely not clear that their archives are safe. Uh, they may, you know, there have been archives here that have burned down. There are others that are in danger of burning down. So I think I responded very strongly to films in the currents that felt to me like they were super archive rich and probably time will be that as well. Um, I think the inheritance, you know, Efraim Masilis was a beautiful way of working. I mean, in fact, when I interviewed him, he said, you know, I think everyone should have an archive. We should all start board we should all start just hoarding our own archives and whatever it might be vinyl records or, or he collected uh poetry sign you know african-american poets signs which is a very beautiful idea i saw a very good documentary that i was very excited about which is uh louis lopez carrasco's 
the year of the discovery, which is again, someone who basically gathered all this footage of people in 1992 um, meeting at this uh, snacks bar in southeastern Spain and working class and middle class, you know, and what's happening is they're having the Barcelona Olympics and the government propaganda is lauding, you know, neoliberal economics and everything's great and the future looks bright and here are the people sitting in their snacks bar and talking about tremendous unemployment, talking about how the unions are just being pressured and just this kind of daily and and it was tremendous how pertinent that film felt uh, because the things they're talking about like how the industry is passing off this idea that you can either create jobs or protect the environment i feel like that's something out of last week's or this week's debate presidential debate and to see the acuity of the working in the middle class in that film knowing very well that that's a false dichotomy i mean there's just such a historical lesson in that um, and it's also beautifully done in terms of form because it's actually, so you have all this eight millimeter footage uh, that they extracted bits and conversations. So you feel like you're in a bar and people are just having these different threads, but it's also split screen. So you're looking at two different situation, situations happening in the same bar at the same time. And sometimes you have someone talking about unemployment while someone else is staring off into space. And it's beautiful to see how one frame kind of colors the other and the threads. There's one moment where the much older generation that was much more consciously politicized is talking about that time and the segment is put together as if they're speaking directly to this young generation now that's in the other frame, someone who's just completely adrift. So it's just, I mean, it's, it's gorgeously, it's like three and a half hours of, maybe because in Brazil, the snack bars, the botecos are also institutions and we have this special longing for that. And, and this film, I think it's a really a, a, a gorgeous testament to how you can A, use the archive teach us something, create this atmosphere, and really with cinema kind of reshape our sense of space and time. Mm. Yeah, it's, it's one of probably, it will probably be one of my favorite films of the year, but we'll see. I'm very excited to see that one. That is one I haven't gotten to, but that moment of liberalization in the early 1990s that changed so many countries culturally and economically, like in India, I mean, it's just this juncture and there's the, a whole cinema that has come out of that, you know, trying to capture yeah. the effects of that. And um, yeah, I, I'm just very curious because yeah, I think that is a moment that feels recent, but also a political and cultural change that seems somehow against history, you know, like it's sure. against archiving, it's against history. It's, it's this neoliberal present. It kind of ushered in this neoliberal present like all over the world that, um, I'm, I'm very excited to see that one. Um, but Monica, uh, giving you the mic now for your shout, shout out. I'll try to keep it as distinct as possible. Um, I love Smooth Talk and the Revivals program. So that was the Laura Dern, uh, Joyce Carol Oates uh, movie. I, it plays completely different in one half and the other half. It just takes a whole new direction. Um, and, I, and I was so shocked by it. Um, another one was the monopoly of violence. Um, usually when you think about, you know, talking through the sociological, philosophical implications of violence, it could be very distancing and make you feel like you're in a college classroom again. But here it's this role, it's, you know, footage from on the ground in France and police brutality and talking through with the people who were there, people who both inflicted the violence and, you know, received it. So it was, um, incredibly moving in that regard. Um, and I think the last movie I'll give a shout out to is Night of the Kings. Um, basically, you know, a young man has to keep himself alive by telling it this really gripping story throughout the night in order to see sunrise again. And, in a prison. And in a prison, yeah. yes, <laughs> in, the, in the Ivory Coast. And it's just a way that, you know, it's framed and how it builds out. And then you get to see uh, what the story is and sort of fantastical elements that come into it. It just, you get wrapped up into it. Um, so I also really enjoyed that one. Well, I think telling stories to stay alive is a pretty good note to <laughs> end this chat on. Um, uh, unless anyone has any final thoughts, I also don't, we've, we've gone over time, but I've just enjoyed this so much and 
uh, everyone has aired all their you know favorites and okay great um well thank you all so much for doing this really sad that we couldn't do it in person but i'm i'm very grateful that everyone uh tuned in and um you know it's a great way to sort of cap off the festival and the program thank you to everyone tuning in we sorry, have we any questions sorry i said sorry we couldn't take any questions we just <laughs> blabbed away the whole time i know there was so much to talk but we did take a couple questions i mean i think uh uh, yeah, we, we managed to squeeze a couple in and there'll be many more opportunities, um, you know, to, to keep talking about these films, which are hopefully going to come out in some way or the other in the next few months. There's two more days of talks. There's a talk tomorrow, like I said, with Heinz Emigold and Christian Petzold, moderated by Dennis Lim at 2 p.m. And then on Sunday, we have a talk on uh, two revival selections uh, on James Baldwin and Muhammad Ali. There's, there's two documentaries on both of them. We didn't get into those. Those are quite excellent films too, but they haven't actually screened yet. So uh, check that out on Sunday at six. And that's when the festival ends. I think the movies will be playing for a few days longer. So, you know, we'll all enjoy this NYFF bubble until then. And yeah, and thank you so much and hope to do all of this in person very soon and stay safe and sane and healthy. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Right. It was really fun. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone.